Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We have a good sound system, so I don't think anyone's going to have a problem hearing me. Uh, we have uh, two scriptures we'd like to read. All of them are very gospel-centered and familiar to you. The first is the Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. In Ephesians chapter 2, our New Testament lesson, beginning at verse 1, the Gospel according to Paul. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead, through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we know that we are sinners saved by grace. We thank you that the scripture has taught us this. But we also know that faithful preachers through the generations have taught us this and kept this knowledge alive. And as we study one of them, we pray that our hearts indeed would turn toward you and that we will find our strength and power and peace in you and in the eternal gospel that you have given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Zacharias Ursinus, his dates were 1534 through 1583, just to give you a little bit of an idea of where he fits in. Zacharias Ursinus is best known as the chief writer of the Heidelberg Catechism, and I'm sure many of you have studied it. He also wrote indirectly a commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism because uh, this was actually published with his students' notes. So uh, he gave the material, but uh, his students published it after his death. Thus, her sinus, uh, and that is a Latin term, as you probably know, it means bear. 
His name was actually Zach Bear, or Zach Barr, if you want to take a more Germanic pronunciation. And when you say it like that, he sounds like a local, doesn't he? Anyway, Ursinus is a Reformed theologian, most famous as the head of theology at the University of Heidelberg, where Frederick III, Frederick the Pious, was the elector of the Palatinate, which, of course, is in Germany. His catechism became a doctrinal standard within the Reformed community. This evening, I have three points involving numbers. Three points involving numbers. The first is a tale of two reform movements. During the Reformation, there were twins born. Not identical twins, mind you. The Lutherans and the Reform. You can tell a Pennsylvania Dutch town or city from twin churches in the middle of town. One Lutheran, one Reformed, or United Church of Christ. Now does that sound familiar to anybody? Does it sound like Wendestetl? Yeah. But all of the Pennsylvania Dutch area is like that. You might ask the question, what is the difference between Lutheran and Reformed? A relative of mine at the Rothmo reunion years ago once said something like this. The Reformed say debts. The Lutherans say trespasses in the Lord's Prayer. The Lutherans, they're a lot more rootsy than the Reformed. They're up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> and they believe something different about the Lord's Supper but for the life of me, I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> my grandma, Rothmo, my grandpa Rothmo, were members of Himmel's church that was and still is a union church. Grandpa was Reformed, grandma was Lutheran, but they believed exactly the same thing. Exactly. At any rate, like my grandma Rothmo, her sinus was raised Lutheran, the first generation that could say that. He came from the town of Breslau. It was German at that time, it's Polish now. And he was asked by the city council to train to be a teacher of Lutheranism, because it was a Lutheran town. So at the tender age of 15, he went to the University of Wittenberg, and there he studied under Philip Melanchthon, Luther's well-known sidekick. Now Melanchthon was his mentor and friend for seven years there. He, uh, Melanchthon was known for being ironic. He was one of the few theologians at the time that were reluctant to fight, who tried consistently to keep peace and come to some kind of understanding and consensus. Later, people would say the same thing about their science, that he was ironic, like teacher, like student. Anyway, Melanchthon was the center of the Reformation in its theology. In 1530, he wrote the Augsburg Confession, the gold standard of Lutheranism, Lutheranism's greatest confession. But he also wrote a Reformed Confession around 1540. Guess what the Reformed Confession was? The Augsburg Confession. Only the variant, or what is known as the variata. Only Reformed churches use the variant version of the Augsburg Confession. So here we have a teacher who wrote both a Lutheran 
and a Reformed confession, and was basically almost the same thing. The only difference was in the language of the Lord's Supper. Melanchthon kept tinkering with the Augsburg Confession, trying to find a way to bring the two sides together. But while Melanchthon was the center of the Reformation, he was not the center of the Lutheran Church. And especially after Luther's death, he was attacked over and over again by some Lutherans who did not consider him a real Lutheran especially because he was trying to get along with those reformed guys. This whole process broke Ursinus' heart and slowly but surely brought him into the reformed camp. Like I said, the chief issue was the Lord's Supper. In 1561, a reformed and a Lutheran minister were celebrating a joint communion service at the Church of the Holy Spirit in Heidelberg. They got into a fist fight at the altar. We reformed say the Lutheran punch first. And I believe that. But the Lutherans might have to be so. I don't know. But anyway, Frederick III, the ruler, the elector, of the plant, they fired them both on the spot and called their sinus to be the new head of theology at the University of Heidelberg, which, by the way, was Melanchthon's alma mater. And he called Caspar Olivianus to be the new minister of the Church of the Holy Spirit. Their first job was to write a catechism solidly based on the Bible to bring peace to the land. The whole idea was to bring some kind of peace to this area of the world and end this constant fighting over the Lord's Supper. Now that brings us to another set of numbers, a tale of two key words. Ursinus's catechism had two contrasting key words. One was comfort, and one was misery. In 1563, the Heidelberg Catechism appeared, and question one was, what is your only comfort in life and in death? There are two types of Reformed Catechisms. One talks about what is the chief end of man, if you remember that comes from the Westminster. And that comes from ultimately Calvin himself, John Calvin. But there is a line of catechism that talks about comfort, and they spring from her sinus. So her sinus is very important by introducing this word comfort. And of course the answer is well known, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, what they were saying from the get-go, and especially her sinus was saying, from the get-go, is that it all depends on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar? Okay. There are many other preachers who have said that in other ways, but that is central, a personal relationship with Jesus. And the kind of comfort that he is talking about is the strong kind of comfort there is an old picture of a bishop comforting his troops. The bishop is not praying for them, although that's a good idea, nor giving them medical attention, which would be nice if they needed it. But his comforting of the troops consists of him leading the charge, may swing. He took the lead and made his troops strong, by leading by example. Now, I'm not saying our son was talking about violence. That was not what he was talking about. But he wasn't talking about warm fuzzies. He was talking about what makes us strong in light of life, 
which is pretty tough sometimes, and especially in light of death. The other word that he uses much is the term misery. Behind that word misery is the German word elend. The root of elend means literally no land. Like atheist means no God, so elend means no land. Now this uh, came home to me early in my ministry here in Pennsylvania. I was asked to visit an elderly lady who was slowly dying in the Paula Clinic Hospital. She came from up this way somewhere, and she was a real duchy. I found her sitting in a wheelchair in the hallway there at the hospital. I walked up to her, and I asked, He does, man. He does. And, How are you doing, young lady? And when she knew I could speak Dutch, she jabbered a mile a minute. Believe me, she challenged my Dutch vocabulary, okay? And then she got very quiet and began to speak very deliberately. She said this, It's been a landish. I am miserable. You miss a field dashmacher in Unsuleva. Field dashmacher. We need to go through so much in this life. So much. And it seemed that she drew comfort just from being able to share that with somebody who understood what she was saying. A few weeks later, she passed away. But I will never forget the word Aelin. And as I studied the Heidelberg Catechism, I discovered that Ursinus drew the deep theology out of this word. We are all refugees from Eden. We were kicked out of our home country. And even today, as your sinus's hometown fills with Ukrainian refugees, even as I speak, this is happening. We confess that we are refugees as well. And that would be sad. And that is certainly misery. But there is good news. Jesus came down to visit the refugee camp. He didn't just walk through it and say hi. He came down and lived among us so that we someday could have a permanent home. That home is in heaven. And that is our comfort as Christians. You know, we're not going to live forever, are we? And yet, we are going to live forever. And we need to get excited about that. Because both are true in somewhat different ways. Anyway, there's a final point here. The real gospel consists of three things. Question two asks this question, how many things must you know to live and to die in the joy of this comfort? And the answer, three. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am delivered from my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Now over the years, English-speaking preachers have boiled this down to three G's or three S's. Preachers have to alliterate everything. Guilt, grace, and gratitude are sin, salvation, and service. They both work. For Zionists got the outline from the book of Romans. This is the outline of Romans if you look at all 16 chapters. 
But there is a mini version of it. We just read it, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. But we're not only talking about Paul here, but we see the same outline in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8, in Psalm 107, where there are five rounds of three G's or three S's. All of this comes together in this outline. But beyond that, we see the three G's or the three S's in Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law, or the account of the woman caught in adultery. If you look throughout the scriptures, the three G's, the three S's, are used over and over again. The triple knowledge is one of the keys to understand Holy Scripture, and staying true to the Gospel, the real Gospel. These three G's, these three S's, are solid gold. And you can take it to the bank. I'd like to close with the words of David van der Meer, a theologian and historian. He said this, Ursinus' work on the Heidelberg Catechism has stood the test of time. It is a document for the Church, but more importantly for her people. It is a very personal confession. It is unfortunate that many who have this as part of their Church history do not understand the document and what it truly means. Some just see it as antiquated and fail to comprehend the deep truths that are contained within. Zionists and Olivianus were used by God to produce a biblical masterpiece for the Reformed faith. Let me encourage you to read the masterpiece of the Reformed faith. You might be surprised what you find there. When I graduated from seminary, I could tell you the three views of this and the four views of that. And it came to me that I had to be committed to something. It's at that time I read the Heidelberg Catechism, and although I had a degree in systematic theology, or almost did at that time, it made the most sense of anything that I had ever read. Stick with the Catechism, folks. It will never lead you wrong. It knows the Bible, and you should know anyone and anything that knows the Bible. Amen. Amen.